My name is Rebecca Vieira. I'm Christian Vieira. And we do want to give you a little bit of background in terms of who we are and why we're here. This is actually quite a different audience for me um, because my background, um, and by the way, this is the name of our talk, Visualizing the Invisible, and I'll get into that too, but I wanted to, like I said, give you kind of some foundation for who I am. Um, normally when I talk um, at these kinds of things, I'm talking to physics teachers, so this is quite a different audience for me. Um, I am actually a former high school physics teacher from the great state of Illinois. I ended up making my way out here as a Albert Einstein Distinguished Educator Fellow at NASA headquarters. And now I work at a diplomatic organization, primarily in Latin America and the Caribbean. So I've taken quite a shift, but almost all of my work, honestly, has really been predicated on um, the things that I've used with technology. And so um, when I was a teacher, um, I realized that my students needed access to data. Data is key, and visualizing data is even better, more helpful. And the thing that I was really interested in was how can I get my students engaged with the tools and the technology that they already have, and how can I remove the necessity of being in a laboratory, having commercial equipment in order to see data, to use data, to make meaning out of it. And so that's where I brought, um, I asked my husband actually for some help. Um, not long after our daughter was born, um, I asked him to help create um, tools that I could use to take students on roller coasters so that they could see their changing um, altitude. How many of you, did any of you go to Six Flags in high school? I'm just curious. For your physics, they say, yeah, this is like this phenomenal um, kind of like rite of passage for a lot of us, right? How many of you just totally blew off the day, didn't do any science at all? Just curious. Probably most people, but okay, maybe you're, you're super and uh, overachievers. But I really wanted to make sure it was like a really deep integral experience. And so everything that I really am now comes from roller coasters, which is kind of crazy. Yeah, I'm Christian Vieira. I, I have a big confession to make. I'm actually, until very recently, I was only an Android developer. <laughs> I know, I know, I'm sorry. Andrew, at this talk. <laughs> I might mention the A word quite a few times, Android, so please do not be angry. Um, basically, we, I, as Rebecca mentioned, you know, we created this set of tools to have students visualize what they're feeling in their roller coasters, the G-forces, you know, and, and then I quickly realized our smartphones not only have an accelerometer, they have gyroscopes, they have microphones. You can do so much audio analysis tools with that like fast Fourier transforms, they also have light meters. You can measure the light intensity that is hitting your device. So I decided to, we decided to create all of these sets of tools and put them into one app to have students and uh, educators uh, gather this data and do research or do analysis. So I should say, um, so if you're interested in learning more, almost all of our um, apps are free because they were developed for students um, to download themselves to use. Um, and uh, part of the reason why, frankly, we worked a lot with Android initially was because we were working with a lot of students in impoverished countries. Um, and a lot of them do have access to phones that way, and so we were kind of thinking about that, that, that you know, that, that bigger, um, big, bigger environment. Um, but I think we've had it's about two million downloads, but on average we have like 300,000 users at any given time, um, like regular monthly users. And it's really amazing because about 40% of our users are actually neither teachers nor educators. 40% are actually professionals. So these are engineers out in the field doing things, taking a look at you know, the impact of uh, strokes on mobility, um, all this kind of stuff, head injuries, um, using smartphones. So it's really, really fascinating, I think. Um, so the reason we're here to talk about visualizing the invisible, though, has something to do, has um, more to do with uh, well, we were funded by the National Science Foundation. I have to say this. I love the NSF, um, but we do come as a team. So it's not just myself and Christian. We also have educational researchers. We have a heliophysicist, and then Tyler Angert um, from MIT Lab um, is fabulous and also an iOS developer who's been supporting this work. And so what we'd like to share with you really is what we've been doing with augmented reality, um, specifically with AR Kit. So the objectives of this presentation are pretty simple. We want to share with you some of the development opportunities out there with AR Kit and also some of the challenges. And specifically, we kind of want to give you a case study of what we are working on to help students and rather learners of all ages um, visualize fields, specifically magnetic fields. But I'll tell you, it's not just about magnetic fields. It's about more than that. And so we'll, we'll get to that eventually. So I think here, 
Yeah, well, it over. you know, the first thing is, you know, as we're talking about, we're creating an AR app. AR, we obviously mean augmented reality. You know, it's just the illusion of having virtual objects in the real world. And a lot of, uh, for our purposes, we're using AR kit. I think a lot of us know from like three years ago, three summers ago, Pokemon Go, you know, dropping the Pokeballs in your screen, trying to catch the Pokemon. So that was like, I think, one of the largest uh, AR experiences. And then now there's um, furniture companies like IKEA are using, you know, you can place, uh, instead of going to the store, you launch the app, place like your piece of furniture, see if it matches the dimensions and colors of your room. And even for sciences now, you can do anatomy, bioanatomy models in AR, move around, see each part in quite a lot of detail. Mm -hmm. So again, visualizing the invisible. What I'm interested in from a physics standpoint is in this case, fields. Magnetic fields are really, really wonderful to work with because in my case, um, it's easy to start with permanent magnets. I'm just curious because I've been surprised how many people have not had this experience. How many of you have ever dropped iron filings over a piece of paper on top of a permanent magnet? Good, okay, I'm so happy. I'm always, I continue to be shocked by the experiences people don't have. And the reality is that most people don't realize that we've got magnetic fields permeating our bodies, right? I know some people are scared of that, probably not in this room, but um, you know, popular, popular culture, people think fields are bad for some reason. Um, fields, in physics terms anyway, really the idea of fields only came up around Michael Faraday, I think, late 1800s. Um, and uh, basically the whole school of thought, thought for a long time was that electricity, magnetism, totally separate, completely unrelated. And whenever anything moves, the tendency is to move only in a straight line. So when Michael Faraday came around and started thinking about fields and electromagnetic interaction, it really blew physics out of the waters. And you know, um, physics became, well, it, you know, it, it became more modern, I guess, at the time. So the Earth behaves kind of like a magnet. It's a bent permanent magnet, actually, and the poles are not really as uh, specific or precise as, as we typically think they are in middle school. But again, we've got all these fields that are surrounding this. We've got lots of evidence of this, especially if you live near the north. You've probably seen the aurora borealis. You're all from here, though, right? I don't think we see it here, but if you get a chance to fly over Greenland or fly over Iceland, look out your window, you'll probably see it those particles from the sun interacting with the Earth's magnetosphere. And I don't know if you heard about this. Um, cows, have you heard about animals lining up with magnetic fields? That's what the BBC says. Um, make sure the next time you're driving by a, a field of cows, you might realize they're all facing the same way. I think there's something behavioristic going on there more than uh, magnetic. But um, for sure, we know that migratory animals, like birds especially, do have some sense of magnetic fields. I'm just trying to make the case for the fact that magnetic fields are actually pretty cool. They do um, influence and influence our lives. So the question that I posed basically, along with Christian and our team, to the National Science Foundation is can we use nothing more than just our phones to visualize these things? Because they are, again, all around us, but we don't see their shape. We can't feel them in most cases. So we had three challenges. The first one was to measure magnetic field strength and direction which you can do very easily on your phone, right? You've all got compasses, you probably have compass apps, you might even have a magnetometer app. Um, and we've been for a long time outputting that data digitally or in graphs. But here's the challenge. We next wanted to link this data to 3D points in space. When you did the iron filings thing, that was two dimensional. It didn't give you a really good sense of how that field actually looks three-dimensionally. There's a great trick, though, if you end up going and visiting a high school. You can do the whole iron filing things in jello, and you'll get three-dimensional fields you can even cut through. Really cool. Um, but we wanted to have something a little bit simpler for that, and we wanted to do, we wanted to do more than bar magnets. And then the last thing was we needed to visualize. So we have to think about what does it mean to visualize fields? Because not everybody sees field lines or interprets field lines when they see a whole bunch of vectors in 3D space. Um, how many points do we need? These are questions that cognitive psychologists and things start to think about. How much information do we need to give students and learners so that they can start to fill the gaps? Um, this is just an example of a field visualization. This is not a magnetic field visualization. 
This is actually one of our friends, um, Steve Bintz, who works with HoloLens and has um, learners actually place electric charges throughout the room and then he visualizes the field around them. The difference between this and the other things that Christian already presented about AR, all of those things are computer generated. We did not want to computer generate. I love real, like, when I, I don't know what real means here, but I love, I love data that I'm collecting from my environment. Um, I'm all about computational modeling and all that kind of stuff too. But for this particular challenge, we wanted to use the Earth's background magnetic field, sources of, 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 of um, magnetic fields from permanent magnets, electric um, currents, and things like that. So were we able to accomplish this? Yes, this is an Android phone, I apologize. Um, we're gonna show you the iOS version in a moment here, but this was, we happened to capture a pretty good video. What I have here is a stack of ceramic magnets. It's basically just acting as a bar magnet, and I'm going around it. Um, this is one of our earlier prototypes, and I know the vectors are really big. We've learned to size them, but these are field vectors. So you can actually get a sense of the three-dimensionality of that field, and you'll notice they're not flat lines. They're actually curved. So um, we've been able to do this, or rather Christian's been able to do it. I just come up with the ideas, <laughs> and, then, and, then, and then he does all the development on them, and I tell him when he's wrong. So this is a difficult relationship we're in. <laughs> so Christian's going to explain a little bit more about how ARKit works um, in, in our context. Yeah, so in general, ARKit has just three categories, world tracking, scene understanding, and rendering. Actually, Oh, I'm gonna Rebecca do this one, talking. I'm gonna do this one. It's conceptual. <laughs> so when it comes to world tracking, your phone needs to know where it is in space. And that's actually a pretty hard thing because you can do GPS, right? Um, you can do altitude measurements, but if you wanna move within a few feet or even a few centimeters, that can be a real challenge for a phone because um, you know, it's, it, it doesn't have as many inputs as we do, I guess. So two things we look at, visual odometry and inertial odometry. The first one is I call the hamster kind of uh, allegory, or um, is that the right word? I think so. Um, hamsters, how many of you have hamsters at home? Anybody? Yay! <laughs> how many of you had a hamster? Anybody? I'm surprised. Okay, we have a hamster, and one dies, we go the next day to the store, and we get a new hamster. We just love a hamster. We have an eight-year-old daughter. Um, so the thing about hamsters is hamsters have two eyes, right? But they don't have binocular vision. So their two eyes don't work together. They're only able to see independently um, out of each eye. Your phone, very similar, right? A camera lens, like a single eye. You probably have, depending upon your device, you might have a depth sensing camera, which is a little more complex, but it's probably your front facing one. Your back facing one is just like a pretty much a simple camera. Now, as an adult, as a, um, as a human being with binocular vision, most of us, have you done that thing where you put your finger out in front of you? You can do it right now, it's okay if you want to. And if you close one eye, and then close the other eye, and you look at it with the other eye, you'll see how it jumps because of the different perception, right, from each eye. Hamsters don't have that, phones don't have that, for the most part. So that puts phones at a disadvantage. Now hamsters, they actually deal with this. What they do, if you ever pay attention to your hamster, your hamster hears you, and it comes out to the edge of its cage, and it sits up, and it kind of does this kind of a thing. You know what I'm talking about, right? It's doing that because it's trying to get perspective. And so um, a lot of animals with, with this kind of vision do that. And so we can do that with our phones too. We've got to give the phone a sense of the world. The second thing is inertial odometry. So how does it tell if it's moved or not? You can tell if you've moved or not if we closed your eyes, right, and closed off your ears because you would feel it in your stomach. You'd actually feel it with your ears. And so um, smartphones have something similar. Um, one of the analogies is um, kind of like a little spring system. When you go up and down in an elevator or if you stand on a scale, there's a spring in there too, and that spring compresses or decompresses depending upon your acceleration. Inside of your phone, you've got these wonderful microelectromechanical systems. This one right here is the accelerometer. It has it in three dimensions. It's basically parallel plate capacitors, and as it shakes, as it moves around on the base frame, it changes the capacitance um, of, of those little capacitors, and so your uh, interprets it, interprets that as motion. So if you know you've lurched to the right for a certain period of time, you can guess how far you went. I'm gonna hand it over now, for real. Yes, okay. <laughs> so yeah, basically, as Rico was talking about the world understanding, ARKit, as you're moving your phone like through the vision of the, uh, 
like the hamster sees, ARKit is creating a map of the environment, you know, with coordinate systems. And ARKit has three default coordinate systems that help you align and place objects in, the, in, this, in this environment. The first one, the default, is gravity. Even if you don't put this argument, you will get gravity, and basically that just means that your phone is anchored on the y-axis. So the y-positive axis, y-negative, x, and c. So as you play your, that helps you place your objects in AR. The one that we're using and the one that we find more helpful is actually called gravity and heading. And gravity, again, the y-axis, and heading, with that we're using the compass, the magnetometer, to find north, and north becomes the c-axis. So if you're placing an object in the c-axis, it's uh, towards north in the negative c-axis, towards south, x-axis, we're talking east, negative x-axis, west, and, uh, and y-axis, obviously, up and down. And uh, a few months ago, I was taking a trip to Boston, and I was working on this app. I was testing the app. I was trying to debug the app, you know, placing the little vectors, making sure all my math was correct, and things were not working properly. You know, I was placing the objects, and they suddenly disappeared. Fortunately, Rebecca, my wife, was there, and she was able to uh, correct some of my misconceptions. So here's the video. You'll have to watch it kind of quickly. Do you see the arrows? You see them? Yes. Yeah, so they're going in front, right? So which way is the train moving? Accelerating. It's going back. It's accelerating backwards, right? Now, here we are on an airplane. We're moving really fast on an airplane, but what's happening to those vectors? You're not accelerating. So in the case of that first one where we were on the train, right, those arrows actually weren't moving. They were actually still staying put, but the train was accelerating, right, um, with respect to where they had been placed. So anyway, for me, this is, again, another exciting thing because you wouldn't believe how difficult it is for students, and I say students, but I do mean adults, too, how difficult it is for all of us, even very well-educated people, to understand these basic fundamental concepts of things like acceleration, things like force, and also things like fields, which is why I get really excited. Yes, yeah, so the next part, the, one of the three parts of ARKit is scene understanding, and that's what is how ARKit makes sense of the information it got from the world tracking to world map. It's divided into three categories, feature points, plane detection, and heat testing. Uh, feature points. Feature points is the way that ARKit is, finds uh, interesting features in the environment, looks at each frame in the image and tries to see changing con contrast in the image, perhaps try to find some edges. And for instance, here's a quick picture I took. The little yellow dots you see are the feature points, relevant things that ARKit is finding in the image. I have a tablecloth, a dark color, and a green placemat. As you can see, ARKit is finding relevant features in all of my image. And in general, this means that your AR experience will be very good. You're gonna be able to place objects and they're not gonna be drifting or changing. And here's another image that I tried when we had a white tablecloth on our table. One of the problems with ARKit and most AR solutions is that um, the white area, the white tablecloth, there's no dots there. ARKit is incapable of finding relevant features to keep track of for its world understanding if you have a white uh, tablecloth, and particularly this is uh, very notorious, ARKit can detect horizontal and vertical planes with vertical planes like our walls, just plain colors do not work very well for our kids. So if you want to place like a frame on a wall, it's, it's very, very hard. Unless the wall has some texture, wood table, uh, wood, wood texture. So here, uh, the next part is plane detection. So all of those little feature points help our kid try to figure out where's an edge, what's a plane. And here, um, it's a very simple function. Like I said, our kid can find horizontal and vertical planes. And here I am taking a walk and having ARKit detect planes for me, horizontal plane in this case, and I'm placing a texture on the plane, overlaying on the plane. Oh, did you play? It didn't play. Okay, it will play now. I'm playing a texture only on the horizontal plane. 
And the last thing is heat testing. And heat testing is very interesting because it's how we are interacting with their kit, the world map it created, the coordinate system. Heat testing is simply you grab your phone and my phone has a screen. The screen is 2D. I'm touching the screen, a part of the screen. I'm converting the 2D coordinate to match into an object in the 3D world. So as we're talking about, we're detecting planes. And as I'm touching the screen, I'm casting an imaginary ray of light into that plane. And when there's a hit, when the ray uh, hit an object, I can place an object. And that's how you place objects on planes using hit detection. And here's a quick example of that. I, um, I'm finding a plane and I am placing a cup, a teacup, on my steps in Capitol Hill. And I did the hit test by touching my screen and finding the plane. And the object is now on the plane. Uh, the code for that is relatively simple. You are just getting the touch position. You get uh, the result uh, transformation, uh, transformation matrix. And that's how you can place the object. So the thing is that unlike most AR experiences that you might have had, we're not actually placing things on surfaces. Um, what I'm going to show here is, uh, let me actually go ahead and hit the, the button on it, is uh, first I'm going to show you simple compass. Notice that north is pointing towards my body or towards the bottom of the screen. And when we want to place field vectors, we actually want to place them in space like suspended in space. And so here what I'm actually showing is the background magnetic field of the Earth, which comes across as a lot of a surprise to people. It actually points more down than it does horizontally. Um, some of you may have seen with compasses that they have a slight tilt to them. But anyway, that's beyond the point. It's just something I can't help but <laughs> I can't overlook. Um, but the idea here is that we can't use some of those same tricks, if that makes sense, because they're not sitting on planes. They are sitting at various different places within a three-dimensional grid. Yeah, and the last part of uh, ARKit is uh, rendering, how we're, play how we're displaying to the user this information. So by default, you know, Apple has, you can use Metal if you want to do some C-level like programming to do your 3D rendering. You can use a Sprite Kit, but that's just Sprite's 2D elements. It doesn't seem to fit with or, you know, we want to display 3D context, so we use SceneKit which is this wonderful platform that is so tied into ARKit. Sometimes I'm not sure if I'm using an ARKit function or I'm using actually a SceneKit function. Basically, SceneKit allows you to move objects, rotate them. Uh, and um, SceneKit, by default, has multiple built-in shapes. You don't, you don't necessarily have to create 3D content yourself. Uh, SceneKit contains nine different types of shapes. For this case, I decided to use the sphere. I wanted to see how I can place the spheres in the environment and uh, display the correct uh, magnetic field, give the, some hue, give some color to the image. And that's uh, one of our early demos of just placing uh, each sphere represents the magnetic field at that point in space. Uh, the code to add a sphere is super simple. You, and in this case, and in all of our cases, we're placing uh, objects at five centimeters away from us. ARKit uses the incredibly meaningful uh, metric system in the, instead of the imperial system, so all of your coordinates and have to be using uh, meters, centimeters. Um, one of the cool things that we've been playing around as I started playing with the spheres is the ARKit allows you to place uh, reflections on objects. So I am placing a, here a metallic sphere, and I'm, the camera is grabbing, calculating, creating a cube map, and displaying it on the sphere. And as I move the sphere around, my avocado, as I am a millennial, I was eating avocados, is reflected in the metallic sphere to give a better sense of realism. Ultimately, we decided against using reflections in our app as it just felt like it would uh, confuse or distract the students uh, looking at it. And we do have some uh, challenges with our kit. It, unfortunately, it's not compatible with every iOS device. So you, we put on our info playlist, P list as we don't want users to install the app. Our app is essentially only our kit. 
if we are filtering out the via the app store, nobody can install the app unless this string is a true inter device, ARKit, that their device supports it. Uh, in general, all the iOS devices since uh, release since fall 2015 are compatible with ARKit. So it's very, very compatible. Uh, some features of ARKit are optional, right? You might have a compatible device with ARKit, but for face detection, uh, if you don't have a true depth camera, which is only available on the iPhone 10, 10S, and the new 11 inch and 12.9 inch iPad Pro, you can you know, filter out within your code, not enable certain advanced features to it. And I have a quick demo of my wonderful daughter uh, showing the true depth camera and how ARKit is already providing you all of this for free. You can place meshes or textures on top of uh, objects using the top front facing camera. Another issue we've been having is drift. Um, the world understanding, understanding of our kit can be a little bit messy and sometimes even the user, you know, user error will be recording data in the environment. And then I'm displaying here a little example of that. I recorded this magnetic field and placed the vectors there. And then I am pretending I got a notification, I got an email, I saw an interesting tweet. I take a couple steps away, I return to the session. Uh, the tracking is not right. So we added some features in the app. You know, often you have to have the user restart the app. So most ARKit apps are recommended to have a restart option. And you know, ARKit gives you a status of um, how the scene is looking if perhaps the scene is too dark, if the map, world map is not, uh, it's not reliable, so you can filter all those, those things out. And I have a little example here uh, showing the user a message of what to do. You know, if the scene is too dark, perhaps the user should move into a different area. Try to give feedback to the user as uh, you, need, you need a good uh, environment to show this. And, uh, We've been dealing with uh, rotating objects in 3D, and I had to uh, try to remember the linear algebra I took in undergrad because it's just a bunch of transformation matrices, and they can be a quite complex. They're show, you know, they help you translate your object in, in space, scale your object, and rotate your object. Uh, but you know, ARKit has some wonderful functions that let you try to just. Uh, get whatever you want of it instead of having to deal with the entire uh, matrix. So there's one other thing that has been difficult and I, I don't, I'm not sure how well known or um, understood or dealt with this is by people. So I hope I don't un talk under you, I guess if that makes sense. But one of the things that we found was, so if we're dealing with rotations, you've got rotation of the phone right, which then kind of switches your frame of reference, but then you've also got the rotation of the actual object that you're placing, which again is fairly unusual for AR that we've seen so far in terms of the apps that are out there. So displaying and understanding these rotations can be quite difficult because um, while you might typically just wanna use like something like Euler angles, so just like measuring the angle with respect to each of the three axes, um, that actually causes problems. Have any of you been to space camp? One person, yay, <laughs> great. Um, Space Camp is super fun and um, it's related because, uh, so what I've got here is me on the MAT, the multi-axis trainer, which was originally developed for the Gemini program because they wanted to help astronauts get out of barrel rolls if they found themselves in one, and they did. I think, it was, a, was it Apollo 11? No, it was one of the Gemini programs, um, and then they stopped it. Now it's just a fun amusement ride at space camp. But um, basically what it is, is it's a set of, um, in this case we've only got two rotating rings, and then we've got a rotating platform that I'm on. And um, one of the things that we notice, we can represent each of these rings with Euler angles. But what happens 
both physically and also theoretically, like with through mathematics, is you can end up with something called gimbal lock, which means that when you have those rings and they end up parallel to one another, it can cause a lot of chaos. In fact, it's caused so much chaos that during the Apollo 11 landing, which happened 50 years ago, it's my NASA trivia for you, you all knew that because you were on the mall, right? You saw the rocket launch, yes? I hope so. Um, they ran into a massive gimbal lock issue because they used three gimbals um, when they were, um, I think, I'm not sure if it was Michael Collins or Armstrong, I don't remember. They were trying to maneuver themselves and they kept approaching gimbal lock to the point where if they ended up reaching this situation where their internal inertial, their orientation device locked up, they would have to reset everything manually by looking at all the stars. And so real problems. This actually still happens today with phones in some sense from a theoretical standpoint. But I just want to show you what gimbal lock looks like real quick because here's a cool YouTube video and I'm a teacher. So, <laughs> so um, this was actually a, a handcrafted gimbal, um, set of gimbals. And you notice as that internal silver one, every time it comes really close to that outside silver one, you see how it does the flip? Yes, give me some feedback. Yeah. You do see it, right? That's a really cool demo, I think. Um, homemade from some guy in England. But basically, we actually are seeing this behavior with the phones as well. And so that was one of the challenges we had to overcome. And um, we're going to be honest. We resolved that issue in Android. We're still struggling a little bit with ARKit on that. Um, and part of it is, I think, maybe not fully understanding the, the framework, because there's underlying stuff that's happening, right? Um, and I think we got lucky with Android, or at least that's what Christian says. But um, we're working on it. So I want to show you what this actually looks like. This, again, is outside of our house. North is pointing towards the black car, but more down than north, about 60 degrees down from north. And so as we turn side to side, um, it may maintains a general northern orientation. I know it's not a very three-dimensional thing, but you see how it flips up? It flips as we rotate. It also has some kind of crazy flips. And so we're trying to figure this out. Um, we're going to show you a demo uh, shortly where we're not doing some rotations, and it actually is working out um, nicely for us. But we really do want people to be able to explore three-dimensional space. We want them to be able to rotate and all that kind of stuff. So the official theoretical like solution to this is something called quaternions, which means instead of using Euler angles so that you don't have this accidental lockups, is to use a four-dimensional representation, or it's like it's a kind of projection of a 3D world onto a 4D system. So are any of you familiar with quaternions? Oh wow, look at that. So you know more than I do. So there's experts in the room, Christian also has figured out a lot of stuff. And I, again, I like watching YouTube videos, so that's my education on that. Um, so if you're not familiar with quaternions, there's some really cool videos from, what was it called? Blue, brown? Three blue, one brown. Yeah, yeah, they do some great videos. Um, yeah. So that's what we've been working yeah, on. Yeah, so you know, like I mentioned, I've been working on this cross, um, on both platforms. On Android, I'm using AR Core. On iOS, I'm using AirKit. And I've been incredibly happy with, uh, I was surprised by how pleasant the experience has been to develop for AirKit. AirKit has a consistency of sensors and compatibility. Like I mentioned, all devices since 2015 can run the app. On Android, this is not the case. It's very hit and miss. AirKit runs at 60 frames per second. On Android, it only runs at 30 frames. I, on, I have an Android device that has a screen that refreshes at 120 frames per second. So when I switch from scrolling something and I use an AR Core app, 30 frames feels so incredibly laggy and choppy, and you know, there's so much developer interest on GitHub. A year ago, I checked, there was a massive discrepancy between the amount of repositories with examples on ARKit versus Android. And I just want to share one thing. I had made a comment at the beginning of this presentation that the reason why we started with Android was because I was thinking about access. Um, you know, We've had people who've used our stuff in Ghana and places where there's no internet access, but everybody's got some kind of a, frankly, a junky old phone, right? And so that's why we started with that. But as we, as we ended up looking into it, we found that the access is actually really in the iOS because so many Android devices are so completely incompatible and because we just can't account for all the variations in terms of the sensor precision and things like that. So that's a big lesson learned for us. Yes. Um, you know, some of the minor limitations I found was object occlusion. Obviously, for the air that we're using, we're not using the true depth camera, the front facing camera. So we're relying on the hamster type camera, hamster vision camera. So unfortunately, air kit has a very hard time seeing if I place, for instance, my hand in front or behind an object. 
you have to manually code all of that. It's not given to you by the system. There's now on ARKit 3, ARKit 3 uh, body detection. So you can place an error object, and if there's a whole human, I think it uses machine learning, if it detects a whole human, then you can place objects in front of behind, but little objects like your hand or your arm are not detected. ARKit is extremely battery intensive. My uh, iPhone XS, the battery can run out in less than an hour if I'm doing AR experiences, because it's using all of the, it's using the sensors and it's using the camera, and it's computing each frame, comparing each frame to the previous one. It's very, very battery intensive. intensive. You cannot use the simulator for that, so every little change you make, you have to load on, onto your device. So that you know, adds up time in development. And uh, we have an early version of the app available for iOS. Uh, you can download it uh, if you go to the store and look for Physics Toolbox AR, and you can visualize uh, magnetic fields. Uh, there's the QR code. And, um, so here's just a live example for, uh, not live, I guess. And this is <laughs> iOS. Recorded. This is iOS. This is the iOS um, app that we, I actually did this, what was this, two days ago? Oops. Make it play for me. Um, and I'm not being real precise about it right now. I'm just going around the pole. That's it. I'm going around a north or south pole. I don't know. And what's cool is, of course, I can just move, and I can get some clean space, and I can then work on my other pole. And you'll notice, in this case, they're pointing downish. In the other case, they're pointing upish, which is right. That's good. That makes me super happy. Um, we're trying to get more precise, as you saw with the earlier version with Android, being able to go around and actually mapping these fields, doing swipes at different levels and different distances, all this kind of stuff. Honestly, even explorations of the Earth's background magnetic field are really interesting because I've met a lot of people, myself included, who have a lot of misconceptions about um, background field and how strong or weak it is. So um, where do we go next with this? So as Christian's hooking up real quick, a live demo, um, this NSF grant that we have really has two purposes. Number one was to develop this technology to see if we could push AR into kind of a different space. Um, the second thing was actually to do educational research. I mean, it is, but we are starting our, second, are starting our second year, and in years two and three, we're going to start using this device to find out um, what uh, kinds of misperceptions, naive ideas learners have and how we can resolve them. Um, so let's see. Go ahead. You can do the demo. Oh, no. <laughs> yes, like well, I only have one hand. OK, so here, OK, we have the app. And um, so I'm looking around all of you. Yes, so we can see. I'm placing a vector. And that's the background magnetic field. Mm -hmm. uh, as I'm pointing into the environment, it's a bit jumpy. Mm -hmm. Maybe if I point towards like a table. Here's the problem that we're facing. We're facing some gimbal lock, like we mentioned in iOS. Mm -hmm. It is representing the correct intensity, but in this orientation, it's not representing the correct uh, inclination. Mm -hmm. So here's the problem. The vectors are placed correctly, but I think I'm having some troubles with my quaternions. As I orient the phone, that's the problem that we're facing. Can you put it back? Yes. yes. So um, yeah, so long story short, um, for us, it's not even really just about magnetic fields, right? It's like, what can we do to push augmented reality into this different kind of space? But I do want to say, though, um, I had a lovely conversation last night um, with the other speakers. And um, I come from, again, the teaching profession. There's a lot of love and passion that people put into teaching. And I was curious to know about, from a developer standpoint, what does that look like? Do you love what you do? Like, love it, love it, you know? And um, I think it's wonderful to see the connections between the technology, the education, and these big ideas that, frankly, the National Science Foundation has put forth for us. So as we all think about our careers, I really like to think about what are we doing from a national perspective, from a global perspective, in terms of pushing um, the boundaries of what we do, how we use our technology, how we interact with it personally, but also professionally, and how do we deal with big data. So um, I always try to align myself to these big national initiatives, and that's, that's what our work does. So I guess in closing, I just want to say, I think it was 2013, I thought it was all about roller coasters. And it's turned into something much, much more for nearly at least 2 million people. 
Um, our work has been used for things as, as far you know, reaching as you know, helping look at motor impairments, seeing how do people move using smartphone sensors in order to make modifications for people who have disabilities. We've also had some of our, um, our apps published in things like uh, people who want to do science in the field. So this one on the right was published by the National Academies of Science, um, taking a look at how we're using smartphone light sensors in order to look at enzymatic activity by seeing how light is occluded as it goes through different kinds of um, substrates or whatever, not sure, not a chemistry person, but um, love chemistry even so. Um, but the point is, where can this take us? Where can these fields take us? Where can visualiz visualizing in three dimensions in R and AR take us? Um, and where can AR kit specifically take us? So with that, we'd like to thank you for your time and uh, I know you have a, have a great lunch. Thank you.